Hello, this is Mrs Holly here. Today is our second lesson on Animal Farm and today we're going to be looking at the historical context of the book, which is important to understand before we read any further in the novel. First of all, let's back up a bit and make sure that we're absolutely clear about what context is. Context is the background information we need to understand a text. Historical context is a type of context that involves understanding the time in history that a text is either set in or based on. I'm going to show you a series of images and what I want you to do is to write down a guess. What historical period is important to understand Animal Farm? Pause the video when you need to, to give yourself some time to write. Here's your first image. Have a look carefully and write down what historical period we seem to be talking about here. Here's your second image. And here's your third image. So, if any of you write down perhaps World War I, revolutions, Russia or communism, well done, because that's the period of history we're looking at. George Orwell's book, Animal Farm, is based on the events of the Russian Revolution, which started in 1917. Therefore, to understand Animal Farm, we need to know a little bit about the historical context of the Russian Revolution. Now, I'm going to talk you through exactly what the Russian Revolution was and what caused it. And at the end, you're going to be asked to write down what you've learned. So you need to listen really closely. To start off, I'm going to talk through what life was like in Russia just before 1917, so we can understand what caused the revolution. The image that you're looking at is of Russia's ruling family of the time, the Romanovs. In the center is Tsar Nicholas II, and to his left, is his queen, Tsarina Alexandra Fedorovna, and surrounding them are their children. So this is Russia's ruling family, quite like the English ruling family that we had at the time and still do today. In fact, the Tsarina was actually the granddaughter of Queen Victoria, who was ruling England at the time. The Romanovs were part of the ruling class of Russia and as a result had the vast majority of power, wealth and influence compared to everybody else. The Romanov family, just on their own, had land, property, jewellery and investments that amounted to some £38 billion in today's money. They were the mega wealthy of their times. What we're going to do now is have a look at a short clip of the Romanovs from the time. This is just so you can get a sense of what they were like and the sort of lives that they led. Next, we're going to look at the very opposite of the social scale in Russia. These are the Russian serfs. Serfs were Russian peasants, the very poorest working people in Russia. And as you can see from this image, their lives couldn't really have been much more different to those of the Romanov family. The serfs lived in extremely difficult living conditions. They owned very little and lived in great poverty. They had to work really hard to farm land that actually belonged to wealthy noblemen. Since 1650 in Russia, 
Serfs were forbidden to leave the land that was owned by their masters, and instead they were obliged to live all their lives and work on the land provided by the people that owned them. They were effectively slaves. In this painting from the time, which is called A Visit from the Debt Collector, we can get a sense of the lack of power that these people had. The man in the posh black jacket on the right is the debt collector, come to take some money that those people owe. But you can see that they live in very basic accommodation. They're surrounded by their farm animals and they're clearly in a lot of distress because they have very little and the small amount that they do have is being taken away from them. So, what you have in Russia is a situation where a very few people have a huge amount of wealth, influence and power, but actually the majority of people in Russia lived as serfs. They had extremely poor living conditions, very few political rights and lived in extreme poverty. In the decades up to 1917, there had been some attempts to improve the rights and the living conditions of serfs. In 19, 1861, the Emancipation Act abolished serfdom entirely, freeing 23 million people from effective slavery, some 34% of the Russian population at the time. However, there were still problems. The land was still owned by the wealthy upper classes like the Romanovs, so the serfs had a choice. They could either buy the land they'd been living on for generations, which they could hardly do given they had no money, or they had to leave the land entirely and move to the cities to find work. All of this generated a huge amount of unrest, and there were a lot of revolts and protests in the decades up to World War I. The serfs wanted to be given land to work and live on, and were also angered by the lack of political rights or education. While all this was going on, World War I broke out across the world. Russia ended up fighting against the Germans on the side of the British and the French. But as you can see from the chart on the left, the cost of World War I for Russia was absolutely colossal. They had just as many killed soldiers as Germany, who lost the war, and actually more wounded soldiers. Also, the cost of the war in terms of resources and money was so massive that by 1917, the entire economy was on the brink of collapse, and Russia's public had had enough. They were tired of war and deeply angry and discontented with their ruling classes. They wanted things to change. And helping to organize this was a new leader, Vladimir Lenin. Lenin helped to organize the revolution where effectively the working classes rose up and took power by force from the ruling classes. The Romanov family were all killed. In fact, large amounts of the ruling families from all across Russia were either forced to leave the country entirely and certainly lost all of their possessions. Lenin was a hugely popular figure in the new Russia because he had a new political vision for what Russia could be like. I'm going to show you a clip of Lenin speaking to crowds after the revolution. This was a huge political moment for the country because it was the first time in centuries and centuries that the vast majority of the Russian public felt like they might have a leader that would stand up for them and allow them to share in their overall wealth of the country.
Lenin had very specific ideas for how he wanted to rule Russia. He was a Marxist. That meant that he believed in the ideas of a thinker called Karl Marx, who created the political idea of communism. Communism was a radical idea then and now. It rejected the idea that just a few people in society should have all the wealth and power. Instead, under communism, all people would be equal. All property would be owned by the government and therefore by the public, and wealth would be shared out fairly. Let's just go into that idea in a little bit more detail. So, what we had before 1917 was a capitalist system in Russia. So, as you can see from the icon on the left, the man in the top hat is effectively Tsar Nicholas and the ruling classes. He has all of the money and he has all of the means of production. So he has the factories, he has the resources and the land. And he has all the power over the little blue people on the left, who effectively have no rights at all. Those are our working class serfs. Lenin believed that this situation was wrong and he wanted to move over to the situation on the right, communism. Everyone in this situation is equal. They all own all the money and all the land equally, and everyone takes a fair share. The new Soviet Union was created to be a communist state, aiming to create a fair and a prosperous society for all. So the ambition was for Russia to be ruled in a completely different way after 1917 than it had been before. However, this optimistic new plan for Russia did not turn out the way that people wanted. The thing is, even if you say that all people are equal and own everything together, you still need some people to organize things and to lead the country and to have final decisions. These people, these leaders, will inevitably have a lot of power. And what we see in the decades following 1917 is that those leaders began to misuse their power. After Lenin, the original leader of Russia, died, a man called Joseph Stalin took power. And he and a lot of other communist leaders started to take more and more power and wealth for themselves. While publicly they pretended to be working for an equal Russia, in reality, most Russians ended up living in worse conditions than ever before. This leads us to George Orwell, the writer of Animal Farm. He wrote Animal Farm in 1943 when Stalin was in power and had been in power for some years. So Orwell is writing about things which are actually happening while he writes the book. His book is based on the real events of the Russian Revolution and tries to show the corruption and the lies of the Russian leaders. So the uprising of the animals that the old major suggests in chapter one is a mirror of the reasons for the actual Russian Revolution in 1917. What Orwell is trying to show us is that while the new communist regime presented itself to the world as a huge success, shown through the poster on the right, which shows the prosperous Russians all working equally together to create a new nation, he was saying that actually the country was enduring a lot of suffering because of the corruption of its leaders, and that actually the situation was a little bit more like this. This is a photo taken from the mid-30s during a great famine in Russia, which Russia tried to hide from the rest of the world. What I want you to do now is to have a think and write down the five most important things you have just learned about the Russian Revolution. You don't have to remember everything, and what you're going to be doing just after this is actually watching another short video that will go over the, a few of these details again. But write down for now the five most important things that you can remember. Pause the video to give yourself some time to do this. Lastly, I want to talk to you about the relevance of Animal Farm to us today. 
Perhaps you've been wondering why we would read a 65 year old book based on the events of a far off country in a far off time. However, Orwell's book has a wider message. It is about what happens when people gain a huge amount of power over other people. Orwell seems to be arguing that we should avoid blindly trusting our leaders because he points out that people with huge amounts of power often use it selfishly or cruelly for their own benefit. I can give you a few examples of how that's happened just in the past few years. For instance, we have seen the major car companies of Europe have systematically been lying to us about how much harmful pollution is being created by diesel cars. In just the past few months, the leader of the richest and most powerful country on earth has made it clear statements that he is above the law and therefore can do effectively whatever he wants. We've also seen the Me Too movement, which exposed the huge amount of sexual abuse and discrimination still pervasive against women around the world. We also still live in a world where our rights need to be protected carefully. Government surveillance, whether through cameras or online tracking, means that increasingly the companies we buy from and the governments that rule us know a lot more about us than we do about them. And we also still live in a world of huge inequality, arguably more so than in the time of Tsar Nicholas and the Russian Revolution. This all means that Animal Farm is as relevant and important to readers today as when it was written, because there are always going to be, perhaps, people with more power than others. And whether we're the ruler or the ruled, we need to think about how people are using power and whose benefit they use it for. What you need to do now is go back to your task sheet attached to show my homework and complete the remaining activities. Thank you very much.